Daniel Bouchard is a poet who lives and works in the Boston area. He lives in Arlington with his wife and two daughters and works as an editor at MIT Press. He is a bit of an activist in bringing news of poetry to people with a weekly work he does collecting, compiling, and sending out by email long lists of announcements of poetry events happening in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. He has six books of his poetry published with his latest book, Art and Nature, released and published by Ugly Duckling Press. Dan Beachy Quick of Colorado Review writes about his book of poetry, Bouchard not only attends to the things we neglect to take for granted, blazed by new light in old places, but with remarkable care and nuance, writes of domesticities and other fleeting moments, so charged by the day they mostly escape notice. Please help me welcome Daniel Bouchard so he can share some of his poetry with us. I'm going to read a series of small poems from a, a collection called The Crick, which if you um, know the area, know the Mid-Atlantic, you know that that's a creek, running body of water. <laughs> the Crick. Uh, this, I, maybe I don't need this. Um, this uh, was inspired and, and kind of formulated on the s works by um, Charles Reznikoff, the objectivist poet of uh, kind of a second generation modernist, if you know his work. It's his um, collected poems were reprinted a few years ago by Black Sparrow Press. Uh, the Crick, Flood. Rain fell all night with considerable violence. Water flooded the streets and pavement in torrents. Little ice-lined streams and rivulets began to roar. Chester Creek began to rise and became turbulent and dangerous. Ice 10 inches thick broke up under the pressure and carried away the Lenai Dam and rushed toward the river with great fury carrying ice and debris in the flood. Mills suffered tremendous damage. Warps floated about, the flats flooded, and roads along the creek became impassable. Lumber was swept away in large amounts, and the new pontoon bridge abutments of the railroad were destroyed. The trestle work, too, was carried off, and at the Mason farm, the outbuildings, chicken coops with fowl inside, and a dog in his kennel all washed downstream. Racing the train. Three boys returning home from a carnival took a shortcut across, across Chester Creek. I'll beat you home, said one, and they sprinted across the Parker Street trestle. Halfway across, they heard the express train, St. Louis to New York, thundering toward them. They ran faster, and two jumped away, after gaining the other side. The third boy stumbled on a tie and was struck, and fell 60 feet to the ground below. Salute. William Penn passed the evening with friends, conversing on the affairs of government. The next morning, he crossed Chester Creek in a small boat. As he landed, some young men, against orders of the magistrates, saluted the proprietor by firing two small pieces of sea cannon. They fired one twice to make three reports, dropping in a powder cartridge before the barrel was swabbed. The left hand and arm of one young man was shot to pieces, and a surgeon was sent for, and an amputation took place. Ice houses filled. Mr. Eyre finished filling his ice houses beside Chester Creek, and in honor of the occasion, blew steam out of the boiler, and for 10 minutes it whistled and made a lively time. Plunder, 1777. Three German mercenaries crossed Chester Creek and entered the Martin House. They helped themselves to valuables. The Martin daughter reproached them and received a bayonet wound for her words. The next day, Mary Martin and another young woman, a neighbor whose family was similarly treated, crossed the creek together and entered the British camp to complain. The soldiers were identified, the stolen goods found upon them. Two soldiers hung from an apple tree, the third sentenced to hang them. Sudden explosion. A tube in the boiler burst, filling the cab with steam and scalding the engineer and fireman. Blown from the cab and badly cut, 
The fireman plunged 20 feet into the mud and water of Chester Creek. He was able to crawl to safety. The train was placed on a siding. The passengers waited two hours and arrived at their destination by another train. The Lonely Grave. The single grave of a young woman said to be near the gate of a mill has long since vanished in this thicket of underbrush and wild vines. Her name, whatever it may have been, devolved to the lore of nickname, Magi. People crossing the fort at night saw the shadowy form of a figure standing by the lonely grave. How she died and came to be buried alone on the banks of Chester Creek is not known. Nor was it known why her spirit could not rest whether she drowned herself to escape some, un some unendurable thing, or whether a jealous husband or lover murdered and buried her and confessed the crime years later but never came to justice. The story, mill, and grave, if ever there was a grave, are mostly forgotten. So is the terror this crossing once possessed. So quickly, driven from their home, so quickly did the water rise and surround the house while ice clashed against windows and doors. The family got out without harm, but many of the household goods are ruined. About 10 other houses were flooded. And as all are working people, the loss of their household effects will fall heavily upon them. At different points along Chester Creek, reports of flooded land, damaged buildings, and mills compelled all work to stop. The waters were high at Chester, but the receding tide prevented further damage. People stood on the bridges watching the seething current while some of them remembered the great flood of 1843. Acquitted of murder. The men had gone to Bethel Court for the purpose of meeting girls and met none. Then they walked to Longbottom's Court where they met one girl. She followed them to the boat tied to a wharf on Chester Creek below the Third Street Bridge. The men passed around a flask. The girl grabbed it and ran off. Two of the men chased her. When they returned with the whiskey, a fight broke out. One man was hit in the head with a brick and stabbed. He fell into the creek and drowned. When the two accused of murder were brought to court, three women testified the dead man attempted to enlist them in helping to rob the defendants. A small paddle. Two boys aged six and nine obtained a boat in Chester Creek without oars or sail and ventured out on the river with only a small paddle. The tide being very strong, they rapidly drifted down river when Captain McDade saw their distress and started after them and caught them in the Jersey Channel opposite Marcus Hook. Railroad strike. All winter Italian laborers have been dissatisfied with a dollar a day and there has been considerable growling Yesterday, 200 men poured across Edgemont Avenue toward Ship Creek Woods, carrying heavy clubs and some pistols in their pockets. The strikers ordered the Italian laborers to stop work. Several workmen stopped and joined the strikers while others rested on their shovels, undecided what to do. The embankment is 25 feet below the grade, and the foremen gathered there to watch the strikers, about a dozen of whom stood swearing at the men still at work. The crowd started towards Chester Creek Bridge, where they paused and shouted to the workers to drop their shovels and join them. A strike leader ran toward them up the bank, followed by two others. A foreman drew his revolver and ordered them back. They slowly retreated. A great outcry went up from the strikers on the opposite bank, and a number of them hastened across the gully to aid their comrades. They charged up the bank, yelling, but were met by the foreman, who pushed back the foremost man. The strike leader drew a pistol and leveled it at the foreman. Some men brandished their, brandished their clubs, daring the foreman to open the battle. He aimed his revolver at the head of the man who approached the horse. Men on the upper bank expected to see bloodshed. Then the striker who flourished the pistol pocketed his weapon and mingled with the crowd. Soon the strikers started back in the direction of Chester Creek Bridge. Many approached the foreman and shook hands before leaving and laughed and chattered good-naturedly. As they approached Ship Creek Woods, a man was seen standing on the east embankment waving a red handkerchief while someone rapped on a tin pan. There was another excited rush of strikers, but it was merely a call to supper. One of the strikers stated they would not permit any work between Chester and Philadelphia until an advance in wages was paid. He said he was unable to save any money.
Wicked boys. Some wicked boys were seen skating Sunday on Chester Creek and appeared to enjoy it. None were drowned. Sixteen eighty one. A ship arrived in mid December at what is now Chester. The passengers saw houses from the ship and went ashore to them on the west side of Chester Creek. That night the river froze and the passengers stayed all winter with no houses of their own. Asleep. Jim Wright had been drinking and lay down on the bed of the Chester Creek Railroad and fell asleep at Rockdale. He rolled over and threw an arm across the rail. A train passed by and cut it off at the elbow. The engineer stopped the train and applied a tourniquet. The Great Freshet. When the Great Freshet of 1843 burst the dams on Chester Creek, Mr. Flower was on the meadow near his mill. The water rushed in waves four feet high. Flower was carried into the mill race and caught a vine as he was swept along. He pulled himself into a tree, but the tree was torn from the ground and rushed rapidly down the creek. Flower grasped the branch of another tree and climbed out of the water, roiling with timber and debris. He was treed for hours until the water subsided. Struck. The air brakes hissed before a dull thump when a cow wandered onto the tracks of Chester Creek Railroad near Upland Station. 1971, Oxbow. The chrome on car tops allowed something to hold on to. Others grabbed onto branches, trapped in the trees for hours in darkness. Rescuers, too, were overtaken by the water. Ropes hurled from buildings seldom reached trapped people. An evening of human chains stretching into the fast-moving water. A section of dike collapsed on Chester Creek and flooded Air Park, filling it like a bowl. A woman got out of her car upstream when it stalled on a flooded bridge. A crowd of onlookers shouted to her not to cross, but the water rose and swept her into the current. The creek rose up over the bank. The creek climbed up over the bank. The water backed up and spilled over the bank. The waters were pent up by detritus held under the railroad bridge and burst with fury toward the river. The car lot filled with new Chevys was wiped away. Traffic moved along the interstate, high above, while all other bridges drowned. Bike Trail. From the Northlands, where rivers meet, ran a trail too narrow to walk except singly. It dipped into present-day Chester before following Mechaponican upstream and to the west. Very early white settlers, before even William Penn, got around largely by canoe, down creeks to the river, and up other creeks. How long was the trail here beside the water before Europeans came and built cabins in a box house fort on Chester Creek? Roads crossed it, then a railroad hemmed in on the creek side like an iron seam. The new path is a bike trail. Storms washed out the rails, and the blinking light atop the incinerator smokestack can be seen at times between branches and leaves. And uh, I'll read some, a few poems from Art and Nature, which Ugly, Ugly Duckling in Brooklyn published a couple years ago. This is called Peregrination Route 291, which is also located in Chester for some reason. It must be on my mind. <laughs> it's where I grew up, and I think uh, having kids just brought back floods of memories from my childhood, so I just end up writing about that a lot. I love the mud-rubbed, soaked wood look of things and the weed-thick lots and puddle-filled roads that trace patterns through shredded housing stock with stuccoed facades over brick and some brick house fronts collapsed to sidewalks, overgrown with sapling ailanthus and wild carrot. The voided factories and backfilled dry docks, the splintered stubs of wharf pilings, and the battered foundations too expensive to move. The obits today are filled with master mechanics dead of natural causes. The cosmos blackened overnight in a brush fire of frost. Glass-domed meters clamped to house sides, tether each to a kind of community. 
not to commune but to have heat and light, measuring payment to the utility. Around the corner, downshifting semis cut in and brush their riveted sides along tree branches. Those highway leviathans swing along the back roads, carrying plastic wrapped pallets to the hills and back up to the worn rubber of loading docks. I love this rank air suffused with imagination and the indel indelible texture of memory. Like peach pits, you never forget how it feels in your mouth and the smell of dirt, river smell, and vague chemicals. The cupped metal hand, steel fingernails and all, probes the wrecked concrete column. Did you ever pull a splinter from your skin or turn the corner in freezing wind and come upon the sun-warmed brick front of a bookstore? Toxins of the richest literature remain in the marrow. And this is where she wrote, and this is where she slept, and this is where her water boiled for tea. And what, she, what did she do in the downtime of her private hours, just puttering about the place? with a dampness on the window panes and a chill about the desk. The sense of being ungrounded left me in the ether of this depopulated place. I wanted a poem to contain that, but my daughter was crying from her crib, as if we shared the evening's disheveled loss, or maybe we were just hungry and wanted some comfort, so I picked her up. The Untitled Sun. This is the poem that Beachy Quick references in the Colorado Review. Things we neglect to take for granted blaze by new light in old places. We think of sun warming things in morning cold. We think of sun as a competent agent, venerable and furiously indifferent. No wonder it has been worshipped, though we tend to render it with smiles and dark glasses. Seeds pushed into soil came up after a week to peer out the window. Whatever I can plant, I plant where I find room. And in this room, with many windows, plastic buckets hold whole nurseries of squash, tomatoes, and beans. Friendly plant raiser, withering in its advocacy, a thing to see but never look at, must be worship worthy. What the water must feel like, maybe a burning sensation, like stripping away protection of self, an internal process, an expulsion of self breaks out into growth. A seed wedged under thumbnail, the germination process, not the chemical reaction, but seeing the seedling lift up the soil crust. Cursed to conclude, we truly are stewards of these palmfuls of farm. And I'll this, uh, close with this poem called Time to Empty the Pool. <clears throat> the rock set down in the garden and the red sorrel that finds its way to unfold in sunlight its candy-shaped blossom and the water that flattens the grass and floods all the bugs in its path down to the thirsty hostas and the things that fly out from that wrath on tough little wings that look brittle and the big colored towel of dyed cotton with giant faces of cartoons and the frayed nylon of fold up chairs riveted to hollow aluminum frames and the clouds drifting against blue and the twisting shapes of shade where secretive squirrels and birds ply their gathering trade, and the beds of zucchini and basil whose leaves droop in the heat, and the territorial spiders, and the occasional passing motors humming over the hot road, and your soaked lashes and dripping head, and your grass and dirt-covered feet slipping into flip-flops, and the stories we read under the lamp, and the insects hitting the window pane. Thank you. Time to start another job Pull it down and start anew I'll tear out these old doors and walls Move them back a foot or two Make a bedroom from a den Because their family grew But before I bring my hammer down, I give the past its due, I see them in the chalk white dust as it swirls by my work light, 
I hear them drive those old cut nails as I pull them with a sigh. I'll drag it high, pile it up on that old truck of mine. Haul in tools and lumber to drive another nail in time. I don't have to do this anymore. I know the trade. I've learned my lessons taking down what other hands have made. Their voices echo in the frame. I'm too slow for demo work. I do it just the same. Oh. Not a simple trick of light. I see them down the line. Those old post and beam men in the dust of my work site. I don't know where they are now, if they're alive or dead. A question one who follows may ask of me instead. Where will I be on that day when young men come to move my walls? Will they even give a care? Before the plaster falls Will they hear a timeless voice Singing my refrain Will I be on another job Will I still have a name I don't have to do this anymore I know the trade I've learned my lessons taking down what other hands have made. Their voices echo in the frame. I'm too slow for demo work. I do it just the same. Uh -huh. I feel I owe it to them, though I'll never make it pay. I'm too slow for demo work, I do it anyway. If summer, then motorcycle, four-stroke, bareheaded, then sun, then blare, then burn. Tiene sueños, uno sombrero. If summer, then tomorrow wears shades, naranjas smiling in a bowl then Panam Panama, then eyes open, then hope. If August, then a Route 66 family selfie, all three squinting, grinning. If August, then thin and prune, then uproot the overspreading lilies. If September, then college senior, Hang out on a stoop, half-empty bottle, acoustic guitar. If October, then floods, longed for rains, so longed for rain soaks the parched. If October, then 
Halloween, a lanky young man dressed as a bear. If Halloween, then needle, then vein. If needle, why needle? If kidneys, if only. If November, then turn back time. It's time to leave despair, shock, and rage behind, like discarded lottery tickets or spent race forms at the horse track. Learn from the squirrel, his rush to fill his cheeks and prepare for the coming winter. Deer and rabbit never stop to lament the oncoming cold. There's just the will to survive. Winter is coming, that much we knew. We never imagined how deep or how long, but there it is. No time to consider what might have happened. The tides are turned, the days grow short. Climb out of bed, fold up your quilt. Go out prepared to fight. Carry a big stick and make be known the force that we are and get to work. Hold fast, take action, make noise and march on. Rosemary, 